Uh, this is intended to be the first in my 23 or so part series on the Castlevania games, covering all platforms since its original inception in 1986. This review is going to focus on the Game Boy Advance edition of the original Castlevania. The main difference being that this one has save has a save feature, which helps you save some of your insanity that will, will help you save some of your sanity that will no doubt develop from trying to play this game. It has uh, rather shoddy controls, even for a game at that time. People like to rag on games like Ninja Gaiden for having enemies that will appear out of any out of nowhere, but at least Ryu Hayabusa in those games moves a little bit faster than Simon Belmont and can control his jump in midair. Anyway, back to Castlevania. Um, this game has about seven or so stages, culminating with the battle against Dracula. But strangely or not, strangely or not, I have to. As I play more, I'll probably get a better opinion on this. Death is by far the hardest boss. Death, also known as the Grim Reaper. Unless you have a double or triple weapon, probably the boomerang or the axe, it's really difficult to fight him because he uh, sends out his sides everywhere, flying all over the place, and each one of them hits you for four bars of energy. And I believe you have a total of 16, so you can take, take about four hits. And given as you move pretty slowly and stuff like that, it's not hard to die. Uh, first, Castlevania gaming history. This game uh, was developed by Konami. First released in the arcade is a game called Haunted Castle. That game was known for its brutal and unrelenting difficulty, which I guess the main goal was to get people to spend as many quarters as possible, but this was almost unfairly, punishingly difficult, simply because the American versions of the game you could only suffer like two hits. As was the policy of Nintendo at the time, they tried to create games based on arcade hits, like this and say Contra, or games based on television shows or movies. And they, this was one of the many games, also like Ninja Gaiden from my earlier example, that actually got better when being ported over to the NES. It was a good example of less is more. The graphics had to be downgraded naturally, but the gameplay was enhanced tenfold easily. With its arrival on the NES, the Castlevania, Castlevania became a franchise that would last to this day. And it has gone, uh, it has undergone changes from from more side-scrolling adventure type game to a Metroid slash RPG exploration. And I personally prefer the Metroid style of gameplay simply because it extends gameplay like it can't be beaten quite so quickly and oftentimes as fan service they will throw in modes that function more like the older ones like the Maria and Richter modes for Portrait of Ruin. We'll get that more later on. Anyway, um, Castlevania went to spawn on two sequels in the NES and became quite a well-known series. Um, specifically with this game, the funny thing about it is I actually hadn't played this until the uh, Game Boy Advance release of it in uh, 2004, I believe. It was kind of surprising to see this on the classic NES games uh, series for the Game Boy Advance, because I think it might have been the only non-Nintendo-made game on the list. I'd have to check that. But uh, the addition of a save feature would definitely help our sanity in this game, because uh, you can save at any time and you always start at the beginning of uh, the stage. Um... This game has seven stages or so, each divided by sections culminating in a boss battle. Um, On to graphics. Graphics are hard always to quantify for me when it comes to NES games because while obviously they don't have a candle to almost photorealistic graphics today, I think the nerd, angry video game nerd said it best when he had said the following of Atari, it's like, you need your imagination to really enjoy these games because anything barely looks at what it's even supposed to represent. I guess you could say the NES was the next step because it really was the first console where everything looked like it, what it was supposed to represent. Or at least there was no necessarily confusing what something was meant to be. Except in the case of usually bad games or for the sake of humorous, humorous, um, misunderstandings, which is always fun to do. Um, so, because the graphics are clearly discernible, I'd have to consider, I would have to say that the graphics are quite good, and given the year it came out in about 1987, I'm not great with dates when it comes to NES games, 
because I don't always remember the exact date something came out. But you had, um, you know, Super Mario 2 was right around the corner, and they really, these games, along with Castlevania, they really seem to use their color palette. Like, everything, everything was, uh, was bright when it needed to be. Like, you wouldn't accidentally jump into a pit because you thought it was, like, a flat surface. And again, I think that's the easiest way to pra praise it. Sound. Now, this is an area where I might get some uh, hate mail. Go ahead if you want to. I do not like the music in this game at all. Now, when I say music, what I mean is I do not like the 8-bit renditions of it. Poison Mind, Vampire Killer, plenty of the other tunes. Great pieces of music, but because of the way that the NES sound chip renders them or outputs them, they're just way too shrill. And it's not that even that they're like the typical beep, boop, or beep. I just can't listen to them. And now some before some ragami were just disliking the inferior capabilities of the um, NES sound chip compared to like later systems. I had the NES when these games came out. I first got an NES around 1987, so I didn't really have any alternatives. This is what I had to compare it to. But when I heard it, I just didn't like it. There's only about excuse me. There's only about three or four NES games that I think legitimately have good music that is able to be reproduced on the sound system, the sound chip to satisfaction. And I think that's not only because of the strength of the composition, but because of the limitations of the hardware. And invariably, it always seemed to be skilled musicians like Yuzo Koshiro, because they knew how to work around the technology, which was a great advantage to them. And that's just what I believe about video game music on the NES. And it seems like it was not only it wasn't inferior quality, it's just that it seemed like not enough composers knew how to use the limitations of the NES sound chip and work around them. They like had grander aspersions or aspirations. They had grander aspirations for their music and didn't realize the limitations of what they were working with. Challenge. This game is definitely challenging because of Simon, Simon Belmont's limited ability to move. There's no ability to move in midair. When you've com once you've committed to a jump, that's it. That gives you the standard disadvantages when you're coming to leaping, leaping over pits and stuff like that, but it can also create somewhat of a handicap when trying to fight bosses because many of the bosses can move much faster than you can. There are ways to like even the field, even the competition, using uh, double or triple items, but they always have an advantage over you simply because most of them have attacks that, can, uh, that cover the whole screen, or in the case of Igor and Frankenstein, really a little Fleeman, the little... <laughs> The incredibly annoying enemies like the Medusa heads, they just move so much faster than you unless you see their pattern exactly, they will just drain your life away in like less than less than thirty seconds. Um, I wouldn't quite call that an unfair level of difficulty, because that's as people have often mused, that's just how games had to be back then. Fifty, sixty dollars they had to give you your money's worth, because as speed runs on YouTube show, these games can be beaten usually in under an hour or so. If, say, the enemy only did one or two points of damage to you, or you could beat them very easily, it wouldn't really feel like a challenge at all, so I don't think it's necessarily fair to criticize it. It's more of a warning. Fun factor. As I had said earlier, I didn't uh, actually play this game when it originally came out on the NES, despite having an NES. I'm not sure why I skipped it. I think it was because, like many games back then, you couldn't afford to buy games very often. Even though I think I had a collection of about 15 or 20. You know, not bad for an 8-year-old kid. Um, you had to rent almost every game. And I think by the time I really started playing a lot of more games, a lot of playing, playing a lot more games, I really couldn't play games that often. Three day weekends only. It was pain. It was really hard waiting in between them. I had played Castlevania 2 and Castlevania 3 and loved them. So after you play a game like Castlevania 3, it might be hard to go back to Castlevania, the original, and really have a good time with it. So I had played it later and I definitely recognized its place in the Castlevania history, but I think compared to later, later iterations of the series, it just doesn't hold up. Um, I'll see you next time for my review on Castlevania 2 Simon's Quest, which I'll try and make unique in some ways. See you then.